Shalom Aleichem. It's still the Aleph Nist in the afternoon. And um, I'm giving now a third shir on the Pedic. And the plan is that this shir is going to be only on two psokim, psokim Gimel and Dalid, which will leave the remaining five psokim, Hei Vav Zayin Ches and Tes, for the, uh, I guess you'll call it the fourth and the fifth shir on the capital. I want to start this class by repeating what I said at the end, at the conclusion of the previous class. And that is that in this capital, the form changes. The first two psukim are David HaMelech speaking in first person, or Yankav Avinu speaking in first person, or Tzadikim after Mashiach comes speaking in first person. Esa Einai El Heorim, I raise my eyes up to the heavens, my Yavi Ezri, my help, Ezri, me Hashem. The minute you get to the third per, to the third pasuk, and that's how it remains till the end of the capital, it becomes third person. Somebody is talking to David HaMelech and saying to him, "Al yitain lamoit raglecha." He will not allow your feet to go lamoit. Al yonim shemrecha. Your guardian will not sleep. I guess you don't want to call that third person. You want to call that second person. But there's a change from first person to second person. The first two psukim are. And the second, the third pasuk, the second or or it's a personal lashon, and the se- and the rest of the capital is second person. So in the end of the shir, the previous shir, I gave you suggestions about what the difference could be. The klal is the rule is in Torah that first person shows them the maximum gili. When the Torah speaks in first person, like ani Hashem lekechem, ani Hashem lekechem, ani eche Hashem lekechem. First person means the most intimate, the most direct. Third person, when you talk about him, like if, if we were to say, Al Yitin Lamoitelaglehem, that would be third person. And in between those two would be Al Yitin Lamoitelaglehem, which is second person. And relative to first person, this is an from Nister, meaning you're not talking to a person, that, the person is not speaking for himself, the person is being spoken to. So the the capital is about Hashem. And as I explained to you in the first class at length, it's very clear that this capital is about the union of Shmira, of Hashem being Shemir Yisrael. Five times in the capital, the word Shmira appears. Hashem 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 and so on. So in the first two psukim, the reference to Shmira is in first person. The person is himself seeking the Shemitah, and from the third person on, he's being informed about the Shemitah. So from the perspective of Hasidus, the first two psukim, which are first person, show on a maximum gilui. Hashem is very close to David HaMalach, and he's speaking about him in first person. And beginning with the third pasuk, where David is being talked about as second person, there was third person, this is called Nista, it's called more hidden. And the rule is that Neuchach is more revealed and Nistad is more hidden. But the rule also is that Neuchach is lower and Nistad could be higher. In other words, godliness, which is readily available to us, is obviously closer to us. But by the virtue of the fact that it's readily available to us, that itself is a proof that it's lower. Godliness, which is more indirect, which is not as revealed to us, so it's on the one hand more hidden from us, and on the other hand, the reason it's more hidden is because it's on a higher level. And on this basis, I proposed, and I'm continuing to propose, that the first two psukim are speaking about a closeness between Hashem and Yidin that's more direct. Hashem is more revealed, but it's on a lower level. And in the later psukim, the relationship between Yidin and Hashem is more indirect, Hashem is more hidden, but the relationship with the Eibish is on a higher level. And I even suggested that perhaps this is the difference in Zman Abayis and Zman Agolos. That in the first two psukim, and you answer your question immediately with Ezri, Mim Hashem, Eise, Shemayim, Vaoretz, Hashem is revealed enough to the person that even in as much as he's Eise, Shemayim, Vaoretz, Ezri, Mim Hashem. As opposed to in the third pasuk, where you're speaking a little bit less direct, La Yitin, La Meit, La Glech, Cho, Al Yonim, Shem, Re, Cho, and Hina the Yonim, Al Yishin, Shem, Yisrael. This is not even second person. This is third person, because Shem it doesn't say Shem, Re, Cho. It's Shem, Yisrael. Although the Psukim after Yema, Meshem, Meshle, Akeka, Vedeach, Baloyla is again uh, second person. 
So when you're, you're speaking about the Abish, indirectly, I propose that maybe this is Managolus. But now I want to say something different. And what I want to suggest is based on how we're going to see later the translation of the words of Hashem Tilcha, Hashem is your shadow. Uh, based on the Asicha from the Rebbe, a wonderful Asicha from the Rebbe. Or a Maimir from the Rebbe. It's printed in the, the Rebbe's Tilim. Tilis Menachem. On this uh, capital. And that is the following. When you say Hashem is more revealed but from a lower level, or Hashem is hidden but it's from a higher level, you're talking all about Giluyim. Giluyim means the world exists, and in the world by itself you don't see Hashem. And Hashem enters into this world and reveals Himself. And of course, He most specifically reveals Himself in places where you let Him in. Right? Like the famous story with the Rebbe Rashab and the Slonim Rebbe, who said, To whom does Hashem reveal Himself? To divas velen, to those who wish. So Hashem enters and is revealed to, in places where the Abishtad is desired. Where He's not desired, it's, it's a little bit different how Hashem is revealed. But the whole concept of divine revelation is the classic idea of Giluyim is the presumption that the world is dark and the Abish's light comes from another place and it enters into this world. But there's another idea. And that other idea is what we call Atmos. Atmos means you're not bringing God from another place, you're showing how God existed here all along. And we are taka holding a few days before Pesach. So one of the great Misholim for this idea that Atmos is, that godliness is not being revealed for some other source, but rather you're seeing godliness as it's inherent here all along as the example of Shabbos HaGodl. Because Shabbos HaGodl, the story of the Makim is Fahim the Rebbe has a number of sikhs and Lakut sikhs on it. And what the Rebbe explained, that Shabbos HaGodl was so close to nature that you could argue that it's not even an S at all. It's a perfectly explicable reaction. There's a group of people who know from past performance, from earlier experiences, that their lives are in danger. And they come to their government and ask for help, and the government refuses their help. It stands to reason that they're going to rebel, that they're going to rise up, and you're going to have a lamakim etzayim of chereim. And one of the reasons that Rebbe explains why Shabbos HaGadl is on Shabbos, and not that Yud Nisnes, because Shabbos represents Teva. And the lamakim etzayim of chereim was an incredibly positive thing for the Jewish people, but it wasn't a nest. It was Teva itself, was the world itself delivering goodness to the Jewish people because of the nature of the connection between Hashem and the Jewish people. In Tanakh, biblically, the, probably the best example for this would be the Keshes, the rainbow. As the Rebbe explains in the Kutasiris. Rainbows occur naturally. And the Tater tells us, Hashem tells Neach, that every time you see a rainbow, that's a simon that Ebish wants to make a marble, and he's going to see, and I'll see the Keshes in the clouds. And I won't destroy the world. I won't destroy even one small part of my world, as the Rebbe says in the Kutasichas, about the, the Mabel. So the Rebbe, of course, asks the question, he's not the first one to ask it, how can you make a symbol which indicates Hashem's attitude towards the world? He's happy or not happy based on Teva. If a rainbow occurs naturally, na nature takes its own course, nature has its own volition, its own order. And you cannot say that nature's order is dependent upon people's behavior that when Hashem is upset there's going to be a rainbow and nevertheless that's what the Tater says so of course it's explained in Sfarim it says also look at the Sikhs, that every time you see a rainbow nature itself is saying that Hashem is upset that he wants to destroy his world or a part thereof and he's not going to do it nature itself is telling us the truth of Hashem so even though on the surface there is no uh, unique indicator about Hashem's relationship with the world, there's only a natural indicator. The natural indicator reflects Hashem because in fact, in reality, the whole world belongs to Hashem. So I want to suggest the same thing here. If this Pedic is about Shemitah, in the first two Psukim, the person is looking for Shemitah. Looking for Shemitah because the Shemitah has to come from someplace else. In the third Pasuk, And in the fourth Pasuk, and perhaps in the fifth and the sixth, the Shemitah comes from nature itself. In other words, the, the, the Mepharshim used the word Hashgacha. And in most Mepharshim, Hashgacha means a special attentiveness, a special attention. 
But what I want to suggest is that this third pasuk that says Ayitam Lamet Raglach Al Yonim Shem Recha means that there's a circumstance under which the person isn't looking for his shaymer. The person is certainly not asking me, Ayin Yavi Ezri, who is my shaymer? And having to answer the question, Ezri Mim Hashem. But rather, he lives in a world where the world itself does not allow him to be hurt. Al Yitan Lamet Raglach Al Yonim Shem Recha because the world and Hashem are one. And since the world and Hashem are one, as Hashem guards the Yid, so does the world itself. And my proposal is that this posture, and even the posture, as I'm going to explain, is describing a Shmira from Hashem on a Yid, which is not a Shmira. It's not that Hashem is doing a special act or a special Hashgacha, a special intervention to guard a Jew. The world, as God made it, guards the Jew because the world belongs to God and the Jew belongs to God and the, girl, the God Almighty is concerned with the Jewish person, so the nature itself guards him. In other words, this pasach, which Hashem is hidden, is not hidden at all. It's Teva and Elokus becoming one, and perhaps it's an allusion to how things are going to be after Mashiach comes. So I'm coming up with a radical pshat, and of course I must admit that I'm making this up. And uh, I'm finding that the more time I have to think about it, the more, the more unreasonable, the more chutzpedik, the more out of my madrege the ideas become. But after thinking about it a few times, this is how I'm translating the Pasuk. That in the first two Pasuk, the Yid is looking for the Shemir. And the Shemir comes the Yemavaya. In this Pasuk, the Shemir happens by itself from Teva alone, and Hashem is not mentioned by name. It simply says, Al Yitam Lameit Raglach, Al Yom He or It is not going to allow your regal to have might because Shemrach is Lo And the meaning of the words Lo Yonim Shemrach doesn't mean that you have a special guardian, it means the world itself is your guardian because Hashem is the creator of the world and Hashem looks after his world and automatically Hashem preserves his world. And that's how I'm trying to say the words Al Yonim Shemrach. That Lost Lo Lovid is going to be a state of Shemira where you don't know who the Shemir is. You don't need to know who the shame is because Teva itself does the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Teva itself guards because Teva itself is a lakus. And that's how we're going to translate this Pasuk Al Yiten Laboit Raglecha Al Yonim Shemrech. So it's a much higher idea than the first two Pesukim where the person is looking for the Shemira and he's questioning the Shemira until he finds that the answer is um, Ezimim Hashem. Now, I want to translate the two words. First of all, the word Lamoit, and second of all, the word Raglecha Al Yiten Lamoit. So I found three translations for the word Lamoit. The first um, is in Rabbi Mangel Siddur. It's in the, in the davening of Shabbos. He translates Lamoit, Al Yiten Lamoit, he's not going to allow you to falter. That means to, st to, st to trip. In a different translation, I saw a very similar thing. He won't let your leg give way. Giving way is almost the same thing as tripping. It's losing your balance. So the different English words, so I'm saying both of them, but they essentially mean the same thing. But as I told you in one of my earlier classes, the Mitzudah Tzir says something incredible. That the word Ayit Lamait is like the word Shtus, or Hatoya, or Soita, or Shatu Amvalokto, like you have in my mother, Babasi Ligani, so much. That means to go off the straight path. Al yitam lamait raglach Hashem is not going to allow your leg to go lamait to go crooked to go in a way of shtus go off the middle path go off the straight path. So bechitzoniyus al yitam lamait raglach means Eibush doesn't let you fail, and bepnimiyus al yitam lamait raglach means Hashem keeps you in the kavem tzay in the middle path which is the correct path. Yachas yachas zechuf aneimei, yachas yachas zechuf aneimei, and the chiddush is al yitam lamait is even raglacha. Raglacha means your foot. What does your foot mean? So there's a number of different translations to what the regal means. Before I get to the specific translations of the word regal, I wish to tell a story, which I tell from time to time. It's a story with the Baal Shem Tev and his brother, Lord Rabbi Yashu Kitavir, and the Erechaim HaKadosh, who in Tavshin Mem, the Rebbe spoke about the Erechaim HaKadosh, and he said that he believes that the stories that Hasidim tell about the Erechaim HaKadosh are true, even though the Rebbe Deshver 
even though the three Rikir Rebbe never told these stories. When I saw this word from the Rebbe, I was actually surprised, but that's what the Rebbe says, that Chacha Filuch of the Rebbe Shver, the three Rikir Rebbe did not discuss that. I think Tezvav Tammuz is his yard site. And the Rebbe spoke Tav Shin Mem. I'm almost certain Tav Shin Mem, Tezvav Tammuz, or maybe it's Tezvav Sim, but I think it's Tezvav Tammuz, that it's the yard site of Rechaim HaKadosh, and the Rebbe said that the stories that they tell about the Rechaim and the Baal Shem Tev could be true. And the stories that you hear place the Eid Chaim on a level which is mamish on par with the Heilik of Hashem himself, which is remarkable, which is unbe- unbelievable. So one of the stories brought in this Svarim is that the Hashem Tev's brother in Rabbi Yashin Kitev had traveled to Eretz Yisrael and he tried to join the kibbutz, the Chabura of the Eid Chaim had a difficult time joining. And the Baal Shem Tev asked him so, so he decided to ask the Rechaim HaKadosh if he knows of his Shvag and Helech So he told him, do you know Yisrael Ben Abeliezer from Tlust? He says, no. Do you know, he, he, he identified the Baal Shem Tev by a variety of different titles and each time the Rechaim HaKadosh said he didn't know who he was. So it crossed the Rechaim Kit of his mind that maybe the Baal Shem Tev is not as great as he thinks he is if the Rechaim doesn't know who he is. Until he said Yisrael Baal Shem Tev. Yisrael Baal Shem Tev said Rechaim, I see him every day. The Maila they meet every day. He reported this back to the Baal Shem Tev. And the Baal Shem Tev asked his brother-in-law to ask the Rechaim HaKadosh if he thought the two of them would ever meet in this world. We know Yudel Chitik writes it in his Sefer, it's known from other sources, that there are three different stories. Yudel Chitik means two of them, but there's evidently three different stories of the Baal Shem Tev endeavoring to go to Eretz Yisrael. And the understanding is that part of the reason he wanted to go to Eretz was to meet the Rechaim HaKadosh. That, you know, we were children, they used to tell us that the Hashem Tev would have met the Rechaim HaKadosh, Mashiach would have come, and each time the plan was 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 uh, set back by all kinds of circumstances. So the Baal Shem Tev asked his brother-in-law to ask the Rechaim HaKadosh if they would ever meet Rechaim HaKadosh in this world. So the Rechaim HaKadosh said to, his, to the Rechaim HaKadosh, and asked the Baal Shem Tev, when he sees me, Lamaila, what does he see? And the Baal Shem Tev answered, I see his whole goof of the Rechaim HaKadosh, the Gansa goof from, from, from Kippa Sarosh, until the bottom of the foot, except for the palm of the foot, except for the heel, except for the bottom, bottom of the foot, on the side of the foot. So the Rechaim HaKadosh said, we'll never meet in Elam Hazar. And of course, the understanding is that the goof of the person represents Madregis, and the very bottom of the goof is where the body reaches the physical world and if you don't see the bottom of the goof you're not going to meet on the level of the physical world and this is called the regel al yiten la raglecha raglecha the lowest level so the first translation of regel is the lowest level of a person the Rebbe used to bring in the sikhis for I think of the Rav Nassim, that the heel of the foot is is deimem sheba adam or meis sheba adam the, the skin is hard and without any life it's the lowest level of the person the bottom of the foot and of course, since it's the lowest level of the person, it's the per- place where there's the least sensitivity, the least feel for Ruchnius, and therefore the greatest possibility of things not being perfect. And the Pasik has to therefore say, the Abishtad who guards you. And if my interpretation of this Pasik is correct, his guardianship of you is the Teva itself guarding you is even the Naglach, even the foot, the lowest level of the person is guarded. In addition, there's another translation of the word Regal, that Regal means a cause. And I believe that Amman discusses it made in Evuchim, Mechelik, Alu, Perik, Chavches. I made myself a note that one of the meanings, well, the regal means a cause. The regal amalacha, the regal. One thing which causes another. So, Ayit and Lameit Raglecha can be read, Hashem will not allow the things that you're a cause for to go astray. Meaning, not only is He not going to let your bottom go Lameit, which means to go to falter, to give way, to go off the straight path. But even the things that come as an effect of you, al yitam lamait, the things that you're lagrecha, even the things that you're a cause for, are also not going to go lamait. Or to say it'll turn lamit and lagleit lagrecha, the causes of the person, which is a higher level, the things that that are the raglayim ledovar, the sources of how we live our lives, the regel which is the cause for us, al yitam lamait lagrecha, Hashem is not going to allow the regel which is the source of the person to go uh, off the straight path. And of course, the last translation of the word regal is like Vahaya Ekev. Regal means the end of time, which means Mashiach, even at the end of Golos. And at the time of the coming of Mashiach, which is called the regal, 
even at those last darkest of moments, Hashem is going to protect us from going astray. And again, the way we're interpreting the reason for this is because we're living in a world where the Teva itself supports a Yid. And that's how you explain the last words of this Pasuk Gimel, Your guardian does not slumber. Your guardian does not slumber. So I might as well explain this now. I might as well explain this now. There's a lot in Hasidus on the phenomenon of sleep. You have it in the Maimonim of Purim, Balai Lahu, another the Shasa Malach, and many Maimonim of Purim that talk about the pathology of sleep, mystically, spiritually. And there's also the Maimonim, Ani Yeshein of As a child, I remember learning the Maimonim in the Maimonim Yiddish. One of the first Maimonim I ever learned was Ani Yeshein of and there also there's a discussion on the pathology, on the mystical pathology of what sleep means. And of course the Hasidus is that when a person sleeps, the first thing that you see is that his eyes are closed. Which means the Madrega of Elokus, of Riyah, is completely eliminated. The clarity of Sozer Revision is not there at all. In addition, the lesser Koiches, which are not completely turned off, the hearing and the smelling and the tasting and the touching, but they're distorted. Which is why when people sleep, they dream. And in their dreams, you don't create new realities, but the realities that you already have in your imagination and in your memory become confused. Like the body of a horse and the head of a man. You cannot, in your sleep, dream about a creature that you've never seen in your life. But you can see a little bit of one creature and a little bit of another creature that have been juxtaposed to create a distorted reality because when a person is asleep, everything is in a state of confusion. So Hasidus of Exo explains the Yin and that being awake means most importantly that you see getlechkeit, enayim lehem. And secondarily that you understand godliness and that you're sensitive to godliness and of course that you serve godliness and so on. And when you're sleeping, all your higher faculties are shut down, most noticeably that your eyes are closed, that you can't see godliness. Le'yiru. And as well as the ears, which represent understanding, and the nose, which represents sensing spiritually, and so on and so forth, are also dulled. And the only thing that's operating is the called the Evari Ha'ikol, the Evari Hazon, the Nefesh Hazon, the most superficial, the most external part of the person are functioning when a person is asleep. Forget when a person sleeps, they function better. And the Nimshali is that the sleep condition represents an environment where the higher in Yonim are either completely quieted or confused and only the low in Yonim function. So the concept of a person being asleep means that his Ruchni sensitivities are dulled. But there's also the concept of Uro Loma Sishan Havaye Vayikas Kiyoshan Havaye Valailuhu Nodadashan Samelach that the has the concept of sleep. And that Samach Tzedek explains on this Pasek or the next Pasek in this Pedic. He's very big kids in it, but this is discussed, like I said before, in so many of my modem. I think there's a long moment on this in you from Shina. From Shmois, maybe Tov Reish Nalaf from the Rebbe Rashab. But it's in very, very many places the Sugi of Ani Yashayin of Alibi Yed, but Lai Luhu, not the Melech. Sleep by Hashem means that even though we believe that every moment the Ebish is Mashgiach Bashkacha Pratas, the Ebish to oversees and governs his world with a perfect governance and an exact and a measured uh, expression of his benevolence and his goodness and his order and his purpose. When the Ebish is asleep, the world looks like it's out of control. The truth is, even Bashas Hashinev, when the Ebish is sleeping, he's a perfect Mashgiach, but it doesn't look that way to us. So sleep mystically means that he, he relates to the world in a way that you cannot see him so overtly, so it's the equivalent of somebody being asleep. And that's the story of Purim. Purim happened in Zman Agolo, so the Ebishter was asleep. And the Megillah tells us, but Lailahu, not the Shnas HaMelech. And of course, Hasidus doesn't explain this to mean that the king woke up. That would be Geula. It simply means that in the middle of his sleep, his sleep was disturbed. So the Hasidus to that is, that there's Eina P'kicha Delein Nim, that when we say that in the times of Golos, the relationship between Hashem and His world is such that it appears like as if He's asleep, is true only in the levels of Ishtalshlos, only in the levels where you could speak of Hashem having eyes and ears and a nose and a mouth and hands and so on. But in the Madrega of Atika Kadisha, on the very highest levels of godliness, even when it looks like the relationship between Hashem and the world is that He's asleep, He's actually governing the world and in a way more than in times when Hashem is more revealed. 
which of course is the basis for the greatest miracle of all, like it says in my Mari Hasidus, bigger than Kriyas Yamsuf, and bigger than Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, and bigger than Makas Bechedes, and bigger than Matan Teira, is the miracle of Kifsa Achas Ben Shivim Ze'evim Vehimis Mishtameris. The one sheep among 70 wolves, and the sheep survives. So on the outside, he's sleeping. But while he sleeps, it's still true. Al Yonim Shemrech. It looks like Hashem is asleep. Eini Tanu Yudei Adma. Right? The Pastor says, Eishis Eino Leira Eino. And the Rebbe would always skip the words Eini Eid Novi. In Eini Tanu Yudei Adma, Hashem's relationship with the world looks like there's no Oisais. Hashem's relationship looks, relationship with the world looks like Eini Tanu Yudei Adma. There seems to be no purpose. There really, really is one, but we cannot see it. So the title of the Pasuk is that the idea that Hashem is a Shemer on the higher level means that the Teva itself preserves a Yid. And therefore, our yid ain't lamboy tlaglach, even the regal of a yid, how yid is a cause for other things, and other things are a cause for him, and even the very end of Golas, and so on and so forth, Hashem does not let us stumble. Even in our aglayim, al yonim shemrecha, shmira doesn't sleep. And the meaning of the word shmira in this case does not mean how Hashem is guarding us, but how the world self guards because el oilam, the world and God, they're one and the same thing. And that's the diak of al yonam. Yonam means to doze off. It doesn't mean to deep, sleep deeply. Sleeping deeply is called shina. Dozing off is called nima. That the shaymer, he who guards Eden in the times of Golas, within teva itself, when you don't see overtly that there's a special shemira, but in reality there's a great and a special shemira, is even la yonam. Even though it looks like he's sleeping, it doesn't even slumber off. So shaymerecha means your guardian. And I'm suggesting that it doesn't say Shem and Hashem, it doesn't say Shem Yisrael, it just says Shem and Stam. It's like you have in Zerda, you have Mitzvah Yisai, which is higher than Mitzvah Savaye. It means the Abishtid himself is your Shemir, or Teva itself is your Shemir. And that's how we're translating this third passage, that higher than the Madrege, where you ask the question, and you answer the question, there's the Madrege, where Teva itself, the world itself, because this world is God's, is Ayit and Lamet Aglach, Ayyarim Shem then comes the fourth pasuk. Behold, neither slumber nor sleep does do the guardian of Israel. The guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Now, you may be aware that this pasuk that Rebbe quoted often, especially in the days and weeks leading up to the Six Day War, which was a moment of maximum fear for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And as it would turn out, it was a moment of maximum celebration and joy and solidarity and confidence since the Holocaust. So the Rebbe, before the war happened, was predicting, the Garden of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. But when you say that Pasek, it's a beautiful Pasek, it's very meaningful. But when you bring that Pasek into the Pesach, you have many kashas. First of all, how do you say Ayanim Shemrach and then say Layanim Velayishan? It should first say Hina Layanim Velayishan Yisrael, and then it should say the the guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, and therefore Al Yitam Lamet Raglach is not going to allow even your foot to go astray, to go off the straight path. Ayanim Shemrach, your guardian doesn't sleep. How come it says first Al Yitam Lamet Raglach Ayanim Shemrach, and then it gives you the rule that Hashem doesn't sleep and slumbers? It says in one of the Rishonim, I think it's even in the Meiri, one of the Rishonim says explicitly. That Ayanim, did this pasuk here the Yonav Yishan should be before the first, this pasuk before. In the Seder of the Mekrais, the third pasuk is Ayit Lamet Raglach Ayanim Shem Recha. The fourth pasuk is a klal, is a rule that Hashem doesn't sleep, even when it looks like he's sleeping, he's not sleeping, and he's always looking after us. And one of the Rishonim says that this fourth pasuk is really before. After you say the first two pasukim, where you ask the question, May I, and you answer the question, Ezdim Yim the third pasuk is you should know a rule. Layanim v'leishin shem yisrael Hashem doesn't slumber and Hashem doesn't sleep, and therefore layanim aliyitem lamei tlaglacha layanim shem rech. The source of this idea is in the tilim that I have from a yid, from from the earliest achreinim whose name is Rabbi Yisuf Chivan, as a pirush and tilim, and he says that the pasuk in layanim v'leishin shem yisrael is the reason for the aliyitem lamei tlaglacha layanim shem rech, meaning that at least. Philosophically, figuratively, he the Yonav Lishan Shem Yisrael goes first, and therefore you have 
Because Hashem doesn't sleep. Therefore, Al Yitan Lamet Raglach Al Yonim Shem Rech. So there's a, in other words, there's a kasha in the Seder of the Psukim. How come Hina the Yonim is first, and then it says second, and before that it says Al Yonim Shem Rech, because Nima is lower than Shina. And some of the Mepharshim say the Pshat is that it really is before. And the second question is, if you say Hina Le Yonim, you no longer need to say Hina Le Yishon. You should say Hine la Yishan and Hine la Yonam. Why? Because Shina is more than Nima. Tnuma. Shina means a deep sleep. Tnuma means dozing off. If you say Hine la Yonam, so Koshka Vakavachay me Hine la Yishan. So why does it Hine la Yonam? It's just Hine la Yishan and Vilayonam. So you could say Bepashtis that this is Bederach Leizu Afsu. You say the lesser Chiddish first, the, the, the bigger Chiddish first, and the second Chiddish second. In a say that it's called Leizu Afsu. So these are two questions. Why Pasuk Dalad, Hina the Yonav Elisha Shem Yisrael, which is a rule about Hashem not sleeping, follows Pasuk Gimel about the Yit and Lamet Aglach Al Yonim Shem Recha. And how come in Pasuk Dalad it first says Hina the Yonav, then it says Hina the Yishan. So like I said, after looking in the Mepharshim, especially in the Rebbe, an idea emerged to me. Like I told you before, Yit and Lamet Aglach Al Yonim Shem Recha means that the Shmir of a Yid is coming from Teva itself. The world itself is God's, and the God, the world which is itself God's, doesn't allow even the Raglaim, the lowest level of the year, to stumble. Al Yonum, the idea that in Teva there is also a Shmira, is in a state that it doesn't even have what looks like a little lapse comparable to dozing off. And then it says, And I'll explain to you the way you understand the Say the Psukim as they're written. And this is based on a commentary of the Rebbe that's a Tzedek, here in this capital. And the Tzemach Tzedek's commentary is fascinating. And it explains the Seid of the Psukim exactly. To put it into simple words, there's Das Eli and there's Das Tachten. There's the way Hashem is closer to the world and the way Hashem is farther from the world. The way Hashem is closer to the world is what's called Hislapshas. There's an intimacy in, however you could say about a Lukus, intimacy between the Abishtid and the world. And to give the example that he brings, that in as much as the Abishtid is Mislabish, when the Abishtid punishes a Rasha, he's not just correcting his world, he's actually punishing him. There's an element of Nakoma. Because when the Abishtid is close to the world, the worldly enemies are really enemies and they have to be destroyed. But when the Abish is operating from the level of Ma'ivit, higher than Islam, just as he's removed from the world, as he's removed from the world, nothing has any value to him except what he wants. So therefore, if there's an obstacle, if there's a klipa, a goy, a homa that needs to be punished, he's not punishing the goy, he's simply allowing the Kedusha to take its course, he's allowing the right thing to move in the direction that it needs to move. It may involve destroying evil, it may involve placating evil, but even if it involves destroying evil, and even if it involves placating evil, that's Baderach Agav, it's not the focus. It's what's happening as a byproduct, as an automatic. And on this basis, it's a Machtedek explains the Seder of the Psuk. Again, this is all based on my presumption that this third Pesach, Al Yitav Amet Raglach Al Yonim Shem is describing the world where Teva itself is guarding a Yid, and then it says, What's the pshat? There is a place where Teva itself is a lukus. And like I gave you the example before from the Keshes and the Mabel and the story of Shabbos HaGodl where Teva itself carried out the will of Hashem in the world in a way that even though there was no miracle, it was the overt hand of God. So this notion that Teva itself is the hand of God, that is represented by the Keshes and the story of Shabbos HaGodl and many other stories like it, is from Madreig of, of Atik HaKadish, the one eye that never closes, as opposed to the two eyes and the seven eyes and so on. The one eye that never closes is Mashgiach, from a place of Makif, from a very far away place. So you don't see an overt influence, you don't see how Hashem is changing Teva, but you see in Teva itself, the Shema Yisrael. Al Yonim Shem So Pasa Gimel is describing how the Ebish is a Balabayas over his world to the extent that Teva itself is guarding a Yid. 
But the guardianship of a yid as it manifests in Teva, as described in Pasa Gimel, is having from Hatika Kedish. Al yid and Lamait Raglecha. Godliness on the level of Etzem is not going to allow even the feet of a yid to go Lamait. Al Yorim Shem Recha. The godliness which in nature, which makes Teva itself a shamer of a yid, is Lo Yonim from the Madrega of Hatika Kedish. Which is wonderful. But there's a problem. It means that Hashem is looking after His people, and looking after His people from a very, very high and pure and perfect place where Teva itself is Elokus. But there's one difficulty. It's not how Hashem is getting involved in the world, it's how Hashem is completely passive in relationship with the world. He's obviously involved, but He's involved on such a high level that you don't... He's not manifest. Meaning... You see the effect of what he's doing. You don't see the will in what he's doing. You see what happens in the world, but you don't see that he's doing it. So the Tzemach Tzedek writes that after Al Yit and Lamet Raglecha Yarem Shemecha comes the Pasuk Kin Nel Yon of Elishan Shem Yisrael. That means Hashem goes down from the Madrege. Let's call it Das Elyon. Hashem goes down from the Madrege with the Einab Kicha Vatika Kadisha, which is constantly Mashgiach Bashkach Arpatas on the world. And affects how in Teva itself, Teva itself, a yid is guarded and protected, that Hashem should come down to the Madrege of Islapshas. He should come down to that level where Hashem could sleep, where Hashem could relate to the world in a way that you don't see his hand. And nevertheless, you say, He neither slumbers nor sleeps. Meaning, even the way he comes down to a Madrege, where the world has some effect, so to speak, on his relationship with us. That there is a prospect and a possibility of sleep. Nevertheless, we say, That's why it's a Chiddush. First you say that, And then you say, But it should say first, Because Shina is a stronger term than Tnuah. And the answer B'derech Efsher is Tenuma means falling asleep. Shin means to put yourself to sleep. You know, there's a word in Tere Sholem, but the Bilu Parachet and the Alter Rebbe, the Rebbe Shabbos is as man Shin in Lamayla, the Bilu fakt sich legen schlof and the Alter Rebbe fakt ein schlof. Alter Rebbe fell asleep because it was a man Shin, he fell asleep without making himself go to sleep because it was a Merkava. And the Bilu, the Rebbe Rashab said, he held for the Bilu, but the Bilu used to put himself to sleep. So there's a person falling asleep and a person putting himself to sleep. When it's a negative concept of sleep, which is worse? To fall asleep or to put yourself to sleep? Obviously, when you put yourself to sleep, you sleep more deeply. But at least you're doing it deliberately. Falling asleep shows on a sleepiness, a general sleepiness. And that's how you read the Pesach. That the Ebishter's relationship with the world on the higher levels is al yit al yonim shem that his relationship with the world is the Teva and Elokus are one. And the Eibishter, who is one with the world, guards a Jew. But then he comes down to the Madreig of proactivity, where he, so to speak, separate from the world, Das Tachten, and he's choosing to guard the Jews. He doesn't fall asleep. Which, even though the sleep is not as deep, it shows on a weakening in his relationship with the world. V'lo Yishin doesn't put himself to sleep. Putting himself to sleep may be a deeper sleep, but it's, a, it's much more of a deliberate choice than Tnuma. And that's how you read this Pasuk. After you describe that Hashem Shmira over the world, how Teva itself is Shemir, again, this is based on the Tzemach Tzedek in Yol Eir, Hashem goes down from Das Elyon to Das Tachten, that he's not sleeping to guard the Jewish people, should be a proactive not sleeping, even a level where you could speak about Hashem as saying, Ur Olam even on that level, we say, La Yonim, he doesn't fall asleep, but La Yishin, he doesn't fall asleep on purpose. It, uh, it may look like there's a Maimed the Matzav of Shinan, and in reality, La Yonim, La Yishin. So it makes sense that the sequence of the Psukim would be first Pasuk Gimel, and then the Klal of Pasuk Dalid, of Hina, La Yonim, La Yishin. And you don't have to say that Pasuk Dalid really is before Pasuk Gimel, it's Mintaseder. It's the correct order. First, you're describing how Hashem is one with His world, and the world itself guards a Jew, and then you say that Hashem's descending to a place where He has a relationship with the world, and when it's a he explains it, He uses the example of 
when a Haman is killed, it's also an Einish for Haman. It's not just a, a ticken for the Jewish people, because Hashem relates in the Madrega of Hislapshas. That's how he explains the Postuk Layan of Elysian. That Hashem descends to a Madrega where he involves himself in his world where there could be sleep, and we still say Layan of Elysian. And we finish with the two words, Shemir Yisrael, the guardian of Israel. And some of the Rishonim say this goes on Yankov Avinu and so on. So the Rebbe has on these two words, Shem Yisrael, a pshat with a particular context. And if you take the Rebbe's pshat out of that context and you generalize it and you apply it to the whole capital, a very brilliant idea emerges. Shem Yisrael is the guardian of Israel, of the Jewish people. Now, Kabbalistically, Shem Yisrael is a much higher than Madrege than Shem Recha. Because we're guarding Yisrael, not Yankee, but Yisrael, the Jewish people in the higher Madrege. But the way we're explaining Shem Recha, Shem Recha means Hashem, how is one with Teva, is your Shem, which is a much higher level. So what's the Pshat Shem Yisrael? So the Rebbe says, the Rebbe connects it to Shleim Sa'aretz and not letting Goyim put Yidin in a position which is halachically dangerous and not allowed, untenable and therefore not allowed. And you have to keep the halachas, shleiti pasach ha'aretz lefnehem. And that when we're careful to keep those halachas, ha'yonim, hina l'yonim, vishin sheim Yisrael. What emerges from that insight is the following. That there are things that the Eibish that gives us that we have to earn. It's called the serusa d'letato, is serusa d'lyelo. And then there are things that the Eibish that gives us which is way beyond our earning. It's called the serusa d'lyelo mitzah d'atzmeh. Or Tala the not of Meatika Kadisha. It's a gift from Akadish Baruch which we have no Kali for. So the Rebbe says that the meaning of the word Shema Yisrael is that even when the Abishtar is giving Yidna Shmira from a Madrege which has nothing to do with the Jewish people, we don't have to make a vessel for the Shmira, we don't have to earn the Shmira, cause the Al Yitam Lamait Raglah Yarm Shemrach is coming from the very highest levels. And Faket, he chooses to come down from the highest levels to the lower levels of Hina, the Yon of Yishan, even the way Elokus has been slapshus. Still, Mitzat in the Pekicha de Lenim. In other words, we attack as Meslapish and Zah. The Yon of Yishan. And we nevertheless shame Yisrael. Shame Yisrael means that nothing that a Yid ever gets is for free. Even the things that he gets for free are not for free. In other words, Shame Recha, the idea that Hashem is Shame a Yid. And Hashem is Shem Yid, not B'derech Schar, not B'derech Skula, but B'derech Teva. He created the world, He's responsible to look after us, so He looks after us, how nature itself preserves us. But since we're dealing with Yidin, and by Yidin we say, L'masi Yadecha Tichsei, by Yidin we say, Lechem Atzlo Slei Seichel, by Yidin we say, we don't want Nam and the Kisuf of bread of shame. So we say, even those things that we get from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's in a Bechin of we don't deserve it at all, we also make a keli for it. Like we learned in the Maimon of Kel Deidi, which we're learning by Ashgach HaPratis now, from Tafshan Lamed Vav. And that's how I attached the word, Shem Yisrael. Hashem comes down from Madreka of Al Yonim Shem Recha to the place where there could be Tnuma and Shina, and we say, Le Yonim. He doesn't fall asleep. But Le Yish doesn't put himself to sleep. Meaning, even in a world where there's an Indian of sleep, and sleep means it looks like Hashem is not looking after us. Over there, the higher Madrega Velikus, even the way it's mislabish in the lower Madrega Velikus, is Layanam Velayishan. In other words, the way Atma Savain saved, the way Atik comes down into Zah, it's still Layanam Velayishan, but we still say Shemi Yisrael. Shemi Yisrael means nothing the Jew gets us for free. Even when Hashem gives Yidin things, which is not at all a Kaili for, it's Shemi Yisrael. Yidin made a Kaili to be Zeicha for this Shemir. Whatever it is that Yisrael do, but that's how you translate the word Shemi Yisrael. He ne leyonim v'leyishin Shemi Yisrael, even the inyonim of Shmira, which come from Hashem, which have nothing to do with our avoda. It's called Shemi Yisrael. He's guarding us because of who we are and what we do. So we just explained two more psukim, pasuk Gimel and Dalit. The first two psukim explained in the second shir. We're looking for our Shemir and we find him. And the third and the fourth possible, we're not looking for our Shemir. We don't have to find our Shemir because our Shemir is us. Our Shemir is Teva itself. 
And this idea that Hashem is Shem el higher Madrege then comes down into the lower Madrege. And that's why you say afterwards, and in this say that he ne and then Vilayishan. And you finish the sequence by saying Shem Yisrael, even the idea of Shmira, which comes from the highest Madreges when you're dealing with Yidin, somehow Yidin made a Kali for this Shmira. And Amir Hashem in the next capital, next Shir, we're going to learn the next two Psukim, Hey and Vav. And in that shir, bli neder, we're going to learn a gvaldik of art from the Rebbe on the meaning of the words Hashem Tzilcha. A gvaldik of shat from the Rebbe and Hashem Tzilcha, which is quite consistent with what I explained now about Teva and Elokus being one.